Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of Dow of Wellness, The Healing Hour. Tonight, we have two very special guests. I would like to welcome Dr. Mao and also our acupuncturist practitioner at our Santa Monica Clinic, Francis Lamb. Um, I am so excited to have them. I want to talk about their backgrounds a little bit for those of you that are new to this episode because I do see some new faces on Facebook. And then um, we'll talk about this uh, actual episode, the topic, and jump into our Q&A session. So for those of you not familiar with Dr. Mao, uh, you should know that he is a 38th generation doctor of acupuncture and traditional Chinese medicine. Dr. Mao is the head of our clinic, Style Wellness, which are located in Santa Monica, Pasadena, and Newport Beach. He's also a global speaker. Um, Dr. Mao has been featured on the Dr. Oz Show, The Doctors, Ricky Lake, Katie Kirk, uh, The Home and Family Show. He's a regular uh, guest and many others. He's also a best-selling uh, author and, uh, as I said, a global public speaker. Um, one of the reasons we have him here tonight is because along with Francis Lamb, they have written a book together. So let me tell you now about our beautiful Francis. Frances has been practicing since 2009, and she holds a Master's of Acupuncture and Traditional Chinese Medicine. She is also certified in TCM Nutrition, Orthopedic Exercise, and is a Fitness Nutrition Specialist. Frances currently teaches Qigong Meditation for Cancer Support at Providence St. John's Health Center in Santa Monica, California, and she most frequently can be found at our Santa Monica Clinic as well, so we have a very faithful following for her. And I'm so excited because, as I mentioned, the two of them together have written a new book, which is going to launch in uh, early 2019. The name of the book is called Live Long, Live Strong, an Integrative Approach to Cancer Care and Prevention. And that's what brings us here tonight. As many of you know, uh, October is Cancer Awareness Month, and I'm wearing pink in honor of breast cancer awareness, as are many others throughout the month. Um, I do want to say that, you know, when we prepared this, uh, see, Mal's got his token pink here. <laughs> <Great, great. laughs> Francis has her token pink posted too. <laughs> so, you know, it is inescapable. We said this on the postcard. I'm saying it here. I'm not trying to be contrived about it, but we all know someone who has cancer. Many of us know individuals who have passed away from cancer, um, who are currently undergoing treatment or recovering from treatment. Um, for me particularly, it's hit hard home. I've lost several dear friends to it. Um, my sister-in-law recently went through breast cancer uh, last year and successfully overcame it. In fact, she just had another reconstructive surgery last week. Um, and it is, it's shocking, it's painful. And at the same time, it builds such strength of character and these individuals have taught us so much, not only about their life journey, but also about ourselves. And Dr. Mao and Francis are going to explain why they've written this book and so many wonderful features about this book. Um, but it's very important that we take the time out to be able to understand that there are a lot of options in the um, treatment and they're really going to be talking with us about an integrative method um, that includes several different factors so that's what i want you to be aware of tonight be empathetic understand think about it for those that you love and care about and also for yourself for your own education and awareness because we never know who and when this could hit so with that i want to thank both of you for joining us tonight and let's get started so um i want to jump straight in let me ask you both what motivated you to write Live Long, Live Strong and mm -hmm. Cancer Care and Prevention? Well, maybe I should start that. Um, you know, the seed was planted many years ago. Um, over 30 years ago, I, I was doing a post-grad residency in Shanghai, and I did a, a long rotation um, in Shanghai Medical University's affiliated hospital. It was actually a cancer hospital at the time. And I was really quite taken back by how well the patients looked. And so the more I kind of understood the integrative approach, meaning uh, they were still using chemotherapy, mm -hmm. radiation, surgical techniques to excise the, the tumor, but they were also being supported by Chinese medicine the use of acupuncture, herbal therapy, nutrition, 
and practicing Qigong, which is a mind-body practice, which we'll talk about more today. Okay. And, and, and I also looked at studies that compare the, the use of Western oncology treatments alone, Chinese oncology treatments alone, and integrative East-West approaches, and the best results were obtained, not surprisingly, by combining both East and West, but bringing the best of both worlds to helping patients uh, who are undergoing uh, cancer treatment to help them increase their quality of life during the process of the treatment as well as increase their survival rate and remission rate. So with that in mind, I came back from Shanghai to Los Angeles and began my practice and I immediately began to reach out to oncologists to offer um, you know, our services to help patients uh, in, in coping with their, the side effects that they were experiencing and increasing the quality of life. And it's been a, an incredible uh, you know, journey and in this collaborative process. And you know, it has always been my intention to be able to share that you know, with the writings that I do. And somehow, you know, 18 books into my writing career, as a hobby, I, I never got around to it until um, Frances came along. Mm -hmm. And I recall that when she came to her fellowship uh, interview, she was, pretty, she was pretty clear about what she wanted to do. She says, I want to come here, join the Dow Wellness team, and I want to collaborate and get the book uh, on the integrative oncology out so that we can share it with the world. So that's how the book came about, but maybe Frances can follow up with her version of it. <laughs> Frances, why are you so passionate about this topic? Exactly uh, what you've said, Tiffany, and what Dr. Mao said. I think we have all been touched by people, whether it's a family member, a friend, acquaintance, all of the above. I don't think anyone, any of us um, can get away from cancer, mm -hmm. right? With population growth, there's more people, people are living longer, which means there are more people, unfortunately, um, contracting cancer. And just as Dr. Mao has said he has witnessed and he was in China and he saw the best outcomes, just reading about it and um, knowing all these different studies that I've been doing with the research, looking at the outcomes. And again, the outcomes are so favorable towards integrating both Western and Eastern. Mm -hmm. And a lot of these studies have shown that even combining with a lot of the Eastern herbs can actually enhance the Western. So I felt it was a really a very, very important topic because the books that are out, I don't feel are um, maybe as comprehensive or also the, uh, the current studies, there's studies constantly. So I wanted to make sure that we had a very up-to-date book that could explain well and um, allow people the information and give them access to information. Okay, well, let me ask you both this. You know, I know that we have a global audience, particularly for our, our practices, but I feel like this material, the fact that you're releasing it right now is very timely. What type of shift do you both feel is happening right now on a global a level that makes individuals more open to receiving this type of integrated approach? Well, I mean, I think first of all, it, it's a lot of it is the fact that information is more widely available. You know, mm -hmm. 30 years ago, uh, when I started in this integrative oncology uh, collaborative process, uh, patients were, you know, they, they, there wasn't much information, there wasn't much studies, there wasn't much that they, you know, internet wasn't available. So in a way, the information explosion, the ready access of information has empowered consumers to ask the question, what else can I do to help myself? Because the oncologists that they're seeing, they're so focused on eradicating the cancer. That's all they're doing, you know, really. So when it came to quality of life, the nausea, the vomiting, the fatigue, they just can't get out of bed. And the brain, it's not functional. You you have brain fog uh, and neuropathy. And many of these symptoms are simply not adequately addressed. And so here you are, maybe your 
killing the cancer cells, but you feel you you feel horrible. You just you can't even function. And so it it really I think it was a much more of a grassroots uh, desire for consumers to ask the question like, hey, what else can I do? And then as they were beginning to you know, find the information, as, as all the successes were uh, being shared around, you know, on the internet and so forth, I think you have this groundswell of interest in consumers uh, becoming much more empowered. And, and that's what we're seeing anyway, is that the last 20 years, we're seeing a shift. Consumers taking matters into their own hands and saying, you know what, doctors are great and they help me, but I need to also understand what my disease is about and what more I can do to increase my chance of um, beating this disease. And cancer is one of these conditions where it's it's scary. It's it's you know it's not um, you know it's it's still has a stigma that when you get diagnosed with a big C, uh, you're, you know, you, you may not survive. And that is a real possible outcome. So I think people are infinitely more motivated to ask the question of what else can I do to help myself? Mm -hmm. Okay. Francis, did you want to add anything to that? Uh, no, I'm just really emphasizing there is a, a big global shift and people do want to become more empowered and find ways that uh, enhance their quality of life. Mm -hmm. um, understanding more that there are gentle things that are actually very powerful. And the shift, what's a really positive thing I've been noticing in the past decade and really in the last year or so, there are more major institutions that are starting to adopt and put integrative uh, different practices into their programs. So they're trying to get access again to a lot of their patients. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so who do you consider the audience for this book? Obviously patients undergoing treatment, but beyond that, who else and why? Well, well, first of all, um, the cancer patients are obvious and their family members, their loved ones and you know, those people who just care about someone going through cancer would be interested in looking at an integrative approach to cancer care. But we also put prevention in title because there are people who have strong family history of cancer. And even though genetics is actually a very small part of cancer, but you know, it's enough for people, I think, to become very motivated to do something. And there's so much wonderful research that, uh, that we have now that show definitively that cancer can be prevented, no question. Um, so there's, there's so much great data, so much great research out there. And in addition to that, our title says, Live Long, Live Strong. Right. Well, live long, of course. Uh, I, I think if you have cancer, you want to live long for sure. And, but you want to be strong. You want to be able to you know, beat back this condition. Uh, so uh, the premise of actually cancer and the cause of cancer is interesting. Uh, we start out the book by really discussing about aging as a carcinogen. Mm -hmm. In what way? Well, studies show that majority of cancers develop after you're 50. And over half of them uh, are in people in their 60s and beyond. So it's, it's actually quite interesting. Wait, with the exception of childhood cancers that happen in young people, lymphoma and leukemia and other, you know, very specific to uh, young, the youth, um, majority of cancers do occur as you get older. So think about it. It's not... Um, it, it's, it's actually not surprising. Uh, what is cancer? Cancer is essentially uh, mutations in, that occurs in cells that are then multiplied and duplicated over time and unchecked so yes. that it then becomes a tumor and it proliferates throughout the body and eventually overcomes your normal functions. And so if that were the case, that's the very basic genesis of cancer.
then what we're really talking about is this, you know, the, we know for sure that environmental factors cause mutations, right. whether they, such as chemicals, we get exposed to toxins, uh, medication it, itself, some medication are actually carcinogens. We know that, uh, the UV rays, uh, right. So there are, there are lots of destructive exposures that we come in contact with on a regular basis. And the longer you live, the more errors, more destruction and mutations you have to your cells. And those cells will then simply duplicate and make some more of the error, you know, the, these faulty cells. And so it's not hard to see that cancer can proliferate uh, the longer you live. Mm-hmm. And it's been said that, you know, there's cancer cells in the making every single day in every human body. As your, your body, the, the cells divide, duplicate, make new, new ones, uh, sometimes errors are made and bad cells are made. And, uh, but your body, you know, is dependent on a healthy functioning immune system. So your immune system is fully capable of killing off these mutated cells before they become a problem. Uh, so then we see then sometimes people with autoimmune disease and they begin to take these immunosuppressant drugs. One of the major side effects of immunosuppressant drugs, if you read and discuss with doctors, is that they can cause cancer because suppressed immune function will then lead to uh, unchecked cancerous growth. And so this is one of the major, you know, understanding and tenets of, of cancer. So again, you know, we, if, we, if we think about it from that perspective, you know, aging, aging itself is a carcinogen. So this is why we, we titled the book the way we did, which is Live Long, Live Strong. Mm-hmm. When you live long, you want to make sure you have good health. You want to live long and have poor health because then you are bound to develop cancer. So when you ask who are the audience, well, I sure hope anyone who is interested in living long and healthy and happy lives and want to avoid getting cancer because cancer sure short changes your, your longevity plans. Okay. So uh, it, it, it can put an end to, to a very productive, fulfilling life prematurely. And we all want to avoid that. So, so my, my goal is that everybody would become interested, even if they, you know, if they don't have cancer in the top of their mind, but if living long, living strong are their goals, then this is the book for you. Mm-hmm. So in essence, then you're both offering us a, a guidebook really to well-being um, and taking it to a different level, but being able to understand also uh, for those that are undergoing cancer, that there are options available to them that will give them a better quality of life as they're in their journey too. Um, let me ask you this. So we talk about how it's important with the immune system to bolster it. We talk about this fact of longevity, like literally what factors do you want us to, to take into consideration? Because I don't think many people are aware of their body and what signs to watch for when something starts feeling dis- disruptive. Maybe Francis, if you could start the answering that for us first. Well, um, right then there is to be, have an awareness of your body and to be more proactive and don't disregard certain signs. So an example would be, let's say all of us are tired at some points um, throughout our day, but if you're experiencing extreme fatigue, that may be a sign that something may not be quite right. Um, making sure bowel movements, we ask all our patients about their bowel movements all the time because it is critical. A really good example is a um, patient of mine. I only see once a month, but every month I ask the same questions because I'm trying to see and track if there's any changes. And I had been seeing him for four months Mm-hmm. Always ask, how are your bowel movements? How are your bowel movements? Finally, one appointment, he finally had said to me that his bowel movements for the past three months, he had been seeing blood. Oh, Sometimes. Wow. Yes, exactly. So it could have been anything. Could have been a hemorrhoid, anything. But for some reason, 
my instincts just went another direction and not to scare this person, but I said, okay, this is very important. You have to first thing in the morning tomorrow, because it was an evening appointment, you're going to get up, you're going to make an appointment with your GP, and if that person's not available, you're making an appointment with somebody, and you're going to get tested. Mm -hmm. So anyways, a month later, he came back, and he thanked me because he said um, it was indeed, it was colon cancer. Awesome. So... Um, he said maybe he would have caught it later on, but we don't know later on there's a progression. You want to make sure that you catch anything, especially cancer, at its earliest stages for best outcomes. So Absolutely. being proactive about it. Exactly, be proactive. Any changes that you see within your body that just aren't quite normal, abnormal bleeding, your hair starting to fall out for some reason, um, and it has nothing to do with hormones or stress. Any change, um, a cough that you've had persistent cough for over a month, there's something that your body's telling you and you need to listen. Mm -hmm. Okay. Dr. Bound, did you want to add to that? Well, you know, it's uh, like what um, Francis mentioned. If you seem like you're getting colds all the time, so on average, people should probably expect maybe a cold or two a year, but that's it. Anything more than that, and you're getting sort of um, a follow-on sinusitis, a sinus infection, bronchitis, so forth, uh, repeatedly, then that is an indication that your immune system is not working properly. Mm -hmm. And most people, which is kind of bulldoze through it. Oh, maybe I'm just tired. Maybe I'm overworking. I didn't get enough sleep, whatever. All the excuses, reasons. But that is your body basically telling you your resistance is down. Your immune system is not working at its optimum. And what is the consequence of that? Well, besides you getting sick all the time, there might be other areas of your body that the immune system has taken its eyes off. Think of your immune system as basically patrols. This is security patrol, this is your police patrol in your body. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have enough patrol on the streets, you could have more criminal acting out, you know, crimes are committed, because they basically, this, you know, sort of uh, these cells are allowed to proliferate. And, and that's the really basic principle of the immune system is that your immune system should be working normally. And what normally means is that anytime you catch you know, more than one or two colds a year and you seem to have a hard time fighting it off and you seem to keep getting sick, it's time to really get a health checkup. You can go to your you know, regular GP and run your usual annual checkup. And if something, if, if it doesn't, you know, it may not show up, right? Because the typical uh, general annual tests may not actually reveal, the annual physical may not reveal subtle changes that are showing up as immune system not working properly. So our suggestion is always come in, see a doctor of Chinese medicine because we are able to detect subtle changes in your body uh, that your body is throwing off signs and symptoms that we are you know, really trained to look for. And when we're able to see that, now we can advise you nutritionally, a change in your diet, your lifestyle, maybe you're over-exercising. You know, there are studies that show now that these elite, elite athletes, you know, people who are, uh, you know, sort of out there training two, three hours a day, mm -hmm. they actually have, uh, their immune system gets suppressed and they are three times more likely to get sick with upper respiratory disease than the recreational athletes. Mm -hmm. And so overexercise is another thing, right? So, so again, a lot of people are out there overdoing it and completely depleting their body. And that's just not a good idea. What we, what we promote is a healthy balance, right? So your nutrition, what you, you know, what you take in, what you, uh, avoid um, the lifestyle, the amount of exercise you do, the sleep, the amount of sleep you, you take every night. If you don't get sleep enough sleep, your body is going to produce a lot of cortisol, which is a stress hormone, which will deplete your immune function. Again, everything comes back to this healthy immunity. You kind of have you know, good protection for your body. 
And the reason why, when we get older, we get more cancer is because our immune system declines rapidly. Uh, there's a little gland right here, right in our chest, right here behind the sternum, chest bone, called the thymus. This thymus gland, you know, it's 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 a very critical gland that produces something called killer cells, natural killer cells, NK cells. These cells are your immune cells that go after cancer and they go after viruses and all the bad actors, right? So by the time you're 60, your thymus gland will have atrophied usually to about one-fifth, uh, even one-tenth of the size of what it used to be when you were in your 20s. So this is one of the reasons with a decline in the immune system and a lot of errors in making and duplicating these sort of um, you know bad cells, now you've got a kind of a perfect storm. Why, you know, people, when you get older, you start to have a higher risk of developing cancer. So anyway, you got to be on the lookout. You got to pay attention. And um, you can't just de de depend on doctors. And this is what the book is really meant to do. All right, we want to write a book that will educate people and, and, and teach them what to look for. All right, so in the first sign of change and so forth, you know, in your body symptoms and the way you feel, so forth, you, you need to really start looking into it and follow through on that. Okay. What do you both think is the biggest misconception that individuals have about self-care? I suppose this is a clinical question, but it's also a wisdom question because I find that I don't know if it's the American way, but we're so afraid to talk about ourselves. Like Francis, what you were just saying about your patient, it's so strange how we seek care. And that then when we have that, you know, beautiful practitioner or doctor sitting right in front of us, we're almost ashamed to talk about ourselves and what's wrong with our being and what we need support with. Absolutely right. So. Going back to self-care, so people feel self-care is selfish, that everyone should come first and um, you know they're, they're out driving their kids here and there, they're working late hours, they're doing everything for everybody but themselves. Mm -hmm. And so this is also a book to make sure, yes, self-care is important and don't you want to be the best you can for your loved ones? So it's critical self-care. Mm -hmm. yeah, that's, you know, like what, you know, I think she nailed it right on the head, really, because all, the bottom line is uh, people feel guilty. They feel guilty about, you know, paying too much attention for themselves. It's, it's all about taking care of everybody else. And so women are the biggest, I think, um, victims of this, this guilt, this self-guilt. And uh, because you're you're sort of told that it, you're you, know, you grow up and you be a mom or you you're, you're a woman, so your role is to take care of everybody else, take care of the family, take care of your your grandparents, uh, your siblings, and all that. Uh, so you know there's only so much time and energy, and so you spread yourself thin, and eventually you ignore symptoms that have been there all along. I mean, again, how many women do self breast exam? I mean, really, you should be, but, and everybody knows they should. And hopefully the gynecologist has taught them how to do this, but if they haven't, well, you can certainly learn how to do that just simply by watching a YouTube video. It's not that difficult, mm -hmm. uh, but yet I ask my patients on a regular basis and majority of women don't, they just wait until they get to their gynecological, uh, you know, GYN uh, annual physical, uh, for the pap smear, and then they get their breast examined. But but oftentimes you do self-examination. A lot of women with breast cancer actually discover their cancer by just self-exam on a regular basis, and, and it's small. They go, oh, wow, it wasn't there last month. I better go and call my doctor and figure out what that is. So obviously, sooner you detect something like cancer, you know, condition, the, the better your... Um, your prognosis and your outcome. Okay. Um, what do you feel uh, is changing right now in the medical field? 
in terms of new developments? Like what excites you the most about changes occurring right now in this field? Well, um, as I mentioned earlier, the a lot of the more established institutions have been adapting or adopting integrative practices. Um, for example, I think a, a good example would be uh, the Providence St. John's in Santa Monica. Mm -hmm. They've included the Qigong that I teach once a week for cancer care, their patients and their caregivers. Mm -hmm. So that was new and very exciting mm -hmm. to have a pretty well-established medical uh, institution. But we also see uh, a lot of uh, oncologists and doctors be more open to herbs and mushrooms and different things, making sure the diet is also more of an anti-inflammatory diet. So these are small changes that are headed in the right direction. Mm -hmm. so, so let's talk about these, these changes because these are things that you have actually incorporated into your book as tools as well. Explain to us a little more about what we're going to see in this book and be able to take away from it. So, the book is really meant to be educational, but at the same time, we hope that the oncologists and general practitioners and all the healthcare providers will also read too, because it's really choked full of um, evidence-based practices. We, um, we present uh, many, many, many studies that show the efficacies of acupuncture, for example, for neuropathy that's related to chemo. Uh, for energy, low energy. Neuropathy is for those that don't know. So neuropathy is nerve damage. So you you know pretty you know like sort of after your second chemo treatment, you are going to start probably experiencing numbness, tingling, burning, and uh, you know difficulty uh, with your hands and your feet. And sometimes it gets so bad that they can't sleep at night. It's just burning all night. Very painful or they lose balance because now their nerves damaged and they can't really feel the bottom of their feet. It can be a big problem for, for many of these patients. Well, acupuncture has been extremely effective and it's helpful to reduce much of this, these symptoms. So these are just some examples and obviously acupuncture for relief of nausea and vomiting has been proven uh, for many, many years now. And the NIH, the National Health Institute has, um, uh, has has actually um, uh, approved uh, and recommended the use of acupuncture specifically for nausea and vomiting during chemo. But there are many other practices. Um, Francis talked about Qigong. It's a mind-body practice. It's if we think of it as a kind of a moving meditation. You're breathing, you're get, uh, combining with visualization, and uh, and you're doing very gentle movements. And this kind of unif unified um, by my, my body and spirit approach to, um, to self-regulation. So that patients learn these practices so that they can self-regulate. Uh, for example, for energy, for anxiety, to help them sleep, uh, for better digestion. And it's been, it's been shown to actually um, uh, improve uh, also your immune function. So that, that's just one of these areas. And uh, what we'll also show the reader is that there's a lot they can do at home with acupressure, the use of uh, the, um, for example, essential oil and what they can use. These are all readily available. They can, you know, sort of purchase them uh, at their local health food store or online and they can just use the power of acupuncture points without needling, they can uh, use to um, use acupressure, finger pressure, as well as using uh, uh, the essential oils. And uh, so, uh, so, so there's a lot of things that they can do. In fact, um, uh, what we recommend for our patients, we have this thing called tension release, which is um, uh, uh, our essential oil formulation. And it's, it's got a little eucalyptus, wintergreen, fennel, menthol, and just by applying it to for example, uh, this is a, a point called inner gate, or sometimes called P6. It identifies that. So it's about two inches above your, your wrist line, uh, right in between the tendons. And just by applying a little bit of this, uh, immediately within uh, 60 seconds, you'll find instant relief for the nausea and the tendency, the feeling of wanting to vomit. and uh, 
You can use this for, for pain, like headaches. You can put it right here, behind your neck. Uh, you have trouble sleeping. You put it under your feet. Uh, so there's many uses. And again, you know, again, the more we can empower people with, um, with information, with tools, the better we are able to affect people's quality of life. And by the way, you don't have to have cancer to use this. You can, you know, all of us have issues and little symptoms are just annoying. And so, again, this is just simple examples of, of, of what they'll find in, in this book. And, and much, much more, of course. There's many, many, many tips we give. Okay. Francis, did you have anything you wanted to add as takeaways from the book? Um, uh, I think, again, it's just the, the access to information because a lot of information you have it over here or over there. So to have a place where it's summarized and encompassing, I think that's um, you know, easy access is very important. Also going back to the title and prevention or live long, live strong. We all want to, we're all aging. So we all want to age well and we all want to age strong. Um, just a side note, you know, I, um, go out and I surf, that's my sport. And it's a very intense sport. And I'm surfing with 70 year old men. And it's incredible and it's inspiring. Fantastic. And I think all of us should be able to do that, right? Mm -hmm. So these are ways um, that we can prevent and that's what's really important too is we want to prevent disease. We don't want to wait till we get sick. We want to not be sick. So what can we do to prevent that from happening? Right, okay, thank you. Um, a question for you both. It, you were talking about as well that we can incorporate acupuncture, we can incorporate Qigong, um, changing nutrition, like what types of things would we change about nutrition? And also, do you include uh, herbs in the program too? Or it, I think sometimes we don't know, you know, what is it that the traditional doctor is giving us versus what we can also complement with from uh, Eastern medicine? Well, yes, no question. Uh, uh, we share our, our program completely, right? So this is what we counsel patients on a day-to-day -day basis. We see cancer patients every single day. We work with oncologists around the city. We have patients who fly in from other states and other countries, actually. And so what we want to do is be able to get this information out to the public. You know, it's like, well, the, the next best thing to coming here to see us either in Santa Monica, Newport, or Pasadena offices. And if you can't do that, well, this is the next best thing because we'll be sharing with you our nutritional protocols. What are some of the foods that can help you boost your immune function, help you deal with some of the side effects, help you increase your, your energy, your vitality? So case in point, I mean, you know, why not incorporate cruciferous vegetables into your diet? Right, you have uh, broccoli, cauliflower, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, and other foods that are rich in so, uh, sulforaphane, which is a uh, uh, you know a, a tremendous uh, anti-inflammatory antioxidant. Uh, so that's something that you can definitely incorporate right away. You don't have to wait. You know, I mean, it's kind of funny, right? I mean, your your, your parents reminds you to eat your broccoli when you're growing up. And uh, well, there's reason for that. They're, they're just full of anti-cancer fighting uh, nutrients. And there are many, many more, right? We talk about that. And then we talk about foods that, wait a minute, you know, you need to really pay attention to this because they're not good. They potentially can cause cancer. Uh, you know, good old American tradition of barbecue. And I know we're, I'm gonna get I'm going to get attacked by oh, no. barbecue, barbecue enthusiasts. But, you know, when you barbecue, you actually generate uh, carcinogens, uh, you know, especially cooking meat at high temperature. Uh, and uh, so, so it's interesting from the perspective of like, okay, all right, you're going to eat meat. Let me recommend, okay, grass-fed only because grass-fed beef, at least you've got uh, you know, omega-3 fatty acids because they're eating grass instead of the corn-fed beef, which has omega-6 and 9s, and they're infl inflammatory. So you really want to avoid that. Number two, if you're going to be grilling a, a piece of grass-fed beef, please, please don't overcook it. Don't ruin it. I'd rather you eat, you know, if it's a really good quality meat, 
medium rare. Because again, the, the more you cook it, the more you generate the carcinogens, and that does not make sense. So, but of course, um, we also know from a lot of research that eating red meat five times a week can increase your risk for cancer and heart disease, not to you know mention. So, you know, so if you're a meat lover, I'm not asking, I'm not saying don't do it. I'm mm -hmm. saying eat less of it, right? We can we can lower. Uh, you know, maybe eat twice a week as opposed to five times a week. Mm -hmm. And you can eat other things like fish. You can eat other, you know, proteins. Uh, but ultimately, uh, if you go on a plant-based diet, you will vastly lower your risk for any kind of cancer. Uh, so a plant-based diet, if, if, you're, if you're really, uh, you know, sort of targeting cancer as a condition that you don't want to get because you have a strong family history, then perhaps a more plant-based diet will be more appropriate for you. And, uh, you know, there's lots of confusing diets out there. You know, every day you hear a new diet, you know, the ketogenic, the paleo diet, and South Beach diet, the Atkins, the vegan diet. I mean, there's, you know, it's enough to confuse even doctors, really, because, you know, I feel, I feel it's sad for many of the medical doctors, the conventional medical doctors, because patients are asking them all these questions and really, they really don't have any opinions because they don't, they, they're overwhelmed by like, oh my God, this is, this is too much information. But ultimately, it's about balance. And if you take anything to the extreme, it, it could present a problem. Case in point, um, you know, one of the major causes of cancer is obesity. Right. So, you know, I mean, increase in fat uh, beyond what's healthy will increase your risk of cancer. No question, this is solid science. Mm -hmm. So if you're overweight, uh, it's time to really, you know, face the, the reality of like, hey, you are at higher risk for not just cancer, but also diabetes and heart disease. So. You know, so you need to be smart about this. If you want to live long, live strong, uh, make choices, you know, because listen, you're the one who will suffer from the consequence of your choices and perhaps your family members too. So you got to really think and take that in consideration. And we also talk about herbs, right. a lot of herbs in, in, in our book, mm -hmm. because this is an area that people can do a lot with, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, there are herbs that have been shown to be um, supporting the healthy, natural immune function. They include herbs like astragalus. That's uh, a major herb that helps to improve immune function. In what so, way? Well, it helps to actually increase your, your killer cell activity and production. So right there, it can really help you uh, gear up your troops, if you will, to battle the enemies. And, and, and you've got um, other things. You've got uh, reishi mushrooms, for example, that uh, turkey tail. You've got different kind of mushrooms, my takis. What tail look like? Turkey tail looks like a turkey tail. What do you think? <laughs> I mean, that's what they look like. But no, no, in all seriousness, there are a lot of medicinal mushrooms out there that are, I mean, you know, we present research that will blow your socks off. I mean, it's like there, you need to you'd be eating mushrooms if you can and if you need to be taking some mushroom formula we have um, mushrooms in our herbal formulas we have you know uh, herbs that um, that we recommend I mean like for example during uh, cold season we have an immunity formula that we recommend to patients and uh, and those who are you know really interested in really working on uh, their health, and this is uh, and it's, it's called immunity for uh, immunity formula, right? So right, and this is something we can all take. Yeah, and uh, and there's just tons of herbs in there that uh, are very very helpful to uh, help support healthy function. Again, that's all we're talking about. We're talking about like, how can we help your immune system get better, get stronger, and then finally, just uh, on, on one last thing that I want to just mention before I forget, which is the role of stress. Mm -hmm. In all of this, the world we live in is a stressful place. It's a stressful time we live in. I mean, there's a huge amount of conflict. Our country is very divided. And, uh, and there's just a lot of uh, conflicts on all levels, internationally, nationally, and even maybe even our personal life. 
Mm -hmm. uh, we are just barely keeping up with the amount of emails that we are having to respond. I get about 200 emails a day. And uh, so it's, um, you know, my lifestyle's changed quite a bit from 10 years ago when there wasn't really much email. And now I'm having to spend an extra hour a day just to wade through my email and deal with issues um, that come. So, you know, so what happened is, of course, we all start to get stressed. We'll start to release a lot of cortisol, and that will affect our mood, our sleep, and so forth. So it's really important that you don't deplete your body, deplete your immune system. And so um, one thing that I do on a regular basis is meditation, and this is something that we teach people as part of the Qigong practice. We teach our cancer patients, but everybody really is meditation. So we have... Um, we have meditation downloads, we have meditation CDs that we send patients on with, like here's a stress release, here's calm release, uh, calm meditation that you take home, here's a sleep meditation. So these are all the things that we want people to know that, hey, you're not helpless. There are so many things you can do to help yourself. And, uh, but the choices are yours. What, you know, how much effort you want to put into your health and uh, what sort of yield that you are looking for. And I would say that the best outcome and the best consequence of you know, really taking care of yourself is this. You have energy when you wake up, your mind's clear, and you don't get sick uh, or you, you get you know, well quickly if you do get a cold or here and there. And, uh, and you, you sleep like a baby in the evening and you're happy. Uh, I mean, what more really, you know, um, what more can you ask for really? This is, this is a blessing in life besides having a lot of money, but you know, money doesn't necessarily buy you health. I mean, I'm serious. Um, so, but, uh, but really this is, this is, this is the blessing to have energy, to have good immune system, to have good health, uh, and to be able to sleep, sleep away all your problems. I, I, I really uh, treasure that. I love it. How about you, Francis? Three things you want people to walk away with. <laughs> I'm just going to agree with Dr. Mao because he said it so eloquently. <laughs> That's true. But exactly that is it, is really there are things that we can do and to really take a proactive approach. Don't wait until you get sick. Uh, don't wait until, uh, you know, it just is tough and you're in bed and you can't move. Uh, right now is the time to take those necessary steps and identify what is it that, one, not only just for your health, but we have to think about not just physical health, but mental health, spiritual health. It's all encompassing, and you can't um, neglect one from the other. It all is really a complete um, package in terms of your health. It's everything. So addressing all of those things, I think um, going back to also quality of your life, what is it that you want to improve your quality of life and live a very happy life too. Right. Thank you. That's equally beautiful and it's so important for us to remember. Um, okay. Before I ask you my final question, we actually have questions starting to come in and we only have about 10 minutes left. Um, what I would like to do is remind the individuals that are on Zoom, if you have questions at the bottom of your menu bar, you have a Q&A option or you can go on chat and put your questions there and we will answer those immediately. And then for those of you on Facebook, you do have Leah Jonas on with you. She is moderating tonight. She's our director of operations. She loves on you all as much as she loves on us. And please type your questions into the chat box with her. Um, she's already been passing over a couple of questions to me. So uh, we're going to give you all a moment to collect your thoughts and write your questions. And in the meantime, I'd like to ask to both of you, how do they access this book? Now that you have it written, now that it's just about ready to go, what do they need to get it? <laughs> all right. Well, so what we're going to do is uh, the book will officially be ready uh, and, um, you know, in print as of January. This is at least the, the plan, right? So okay. hopefully we're, we're still on track uh, according to plan. However, we will be making the ebook available sooner. And our hope is that... Uh, perhaps, uh, you know, like the beginning of December, uh, that's really, uh, that would be ideal, is to have it available so as soon as possible. 
uh, you know, I'm, I'm doing a, a, a couple uh, talks at cancer conferences and cancer community in November. So, you know, I, I'm hopeful that, that we're able to make this uh, book available, uh, at least in the ebook form, uh, you know, sometime in, uh, in, in maybe in late November, early December, and then uh, follow up with a, a book in print in January. So anyway, so be on the lookout for it. And obviously we are, um, we're, uh, we're, we're available and uh, we'll be, we'll be doing some blogging as well. One of the things we'll be doing is to begin to share some of this information in the form of a, a blog. So, yeah. Okay, great. Well, I think I can offer up two things from our end as well. First of all, um, as soon as the book is ready for pre-order, we will send out an email to everyone and let them know through both our newsletter list as well as our uh, email subscription list um, and let you know that it is available for you to order ahead of time for your uh, e-download on that. And then I would love from both of you if maybe we can coordinate something for January when the book does um, approach its closer release date and let's rejoin back together and tackle some more of the topics in this because I think it's just such an important topic that a lot of people are gonna have an interest in. I have a lot of questions just around quality of life, but of course we only get an hour and we don't have time for all of those questions. So I'd rather right now dive into some of our, our viewer questions. Yeah, and, and also we're, we're, we're planning and hoping to plan a series of events uh, of, uh, during the release parties, if you will. So we've got three offices in the LA, Orange County area, so we were going to sort of do a kind of a weekly uh, a launch party open house uh, in each of these offices in January, and we hope you can join us, and if you can't, we'll also try to do maybe these live broadcasts, you know, so that uh, there could be a interaction with uh, people from all over the world, and uh, that's, our, that's our hope. Okay. okay. Um, okay, let's dive into the questions. So our first viewer would like to know, um, let's see, whoops, I need to scroll back up here. Yes, okay. Um, our first viewer would like to know, do you foresee a future time when insurance and Medicare will pay for Chinese medicine and preventive medicine? Well, the insurance already pay for it. yeah. Yeah, right yeah. now a lot of insurance companies do pay for it. So you need to check with your plan and find out if it's offered. Sometimes it just depends which plan you are in, and so it may just be um, speaking to your insurance rep, finding out what is your copay, finding out, speaking directly with them, what are they willing to pay. Usually. We have found that most insurance companies will pay partial. It may not be a lot, but every little bit does help. But some insurance companies pay 100% of it. So definitely check with your insurance company. Medicare might be different though. Medicare, uh, currently Medicare does not pay for acupuncture. So uh, our profession continues to lobby uh, the congressman. So, you know, it's always helpful all of us, uh, all of you out there who would like to have Medicare cover to write to your congressman uh, or congresswoman and to really ask them to, you know, advance this cause because the, the, the fact is we can benefit so many more people. And uh, so if, if Medicare did cover. Uh, so, but, but do like what Francis said, reach out and, and ask what the limitations are if they do cover for acupuncture, sometimes they only cover for pain and so forth but again and one day I'm, I'm hopeful because more now than ever uh since the um the, the, the insurance change in in the last um you know five six years in that more policies are covering what they call wellness visits and so the preventative care so you you know your annual physical is taken care of um that's covered. And so we, we are hoping that that also means that one day uh, we will be included in this kind of wellness visit uh, that people come. Uh, they're allowed a few times a year when they come and do so-called wellness visits uh, with, uh, with us. Yes, I think that's a goal we all strive for at this point. Um, okay, what about another question that we have from a viewer is, can you address the later stages of cancer and decisions that have to be made and how this integrative approach can support that? 
Well, it's um, it's you know, it's never easy uh, when you are um, in a later stage metastatic uh, cancer. Uh, you know, it's it's um, perhaps there is maybe not a cure, but there is a management, right? Uh, there is a sort of a new approach to looking at chronic cancer care as similar to, let's say, someone who has diabetes or some kind of chronic disease. Perhaps the disease can be kept under control, but there's no cure. However, that now quality of life becomes even more critical. You know, whether you're functional, whether you have energy to go work, whether you have the vitality to pursue your passions in life, your, you know, continue to, to live your purpose. That's really where I feel Chinese medicine can be a huge advocate and a huge support for patients and to ease discomfort. Maybe there's a lot of pain, mm -hmm. uh, pain medications making you sick. Well, we can offer ways to relieve pain uh, and help you feel more comfortable uh, without ill side effects. And so, you know, there are, there are lots of considerations, but at the end of the day, we're here to uh, support uh, and uh, help maintain as much as possible uh, you know, as best as possible, the quality of life, no matter what stage you're at. Right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, oh, just a comment for those as we're responding to your questions. If we answered it completely, um, please let us know. And if you have follow-up questions, please go welcome to send those follow-up questions in too. Uh, our next uh, question is, um, Let's see. Uh, what if my blood sugar drops rapidly and I need simple carbs to stop it from dropping? Like while driving, um, they, the carbs, are inflammatory. Uh, so on the go, what can they take with them on the go? True. Nuts. You know, not all carbohydrates are inflammatory. So that's just the thing. There's what's called complex carbs and there's simple carbs. So your simple carbs are your candies, your unfortunately, your pastas and things like that. But your complex carbs, get an apple, which is also in the book. It's a, a great piece of fruit to um, also has a lot of anti-cancer properties. But put an apple, easy to take, uh, get some nuts. So you want to combine your carbohydrate and your protein for longer lasting energy. Mm -hmm. And your blood sugar should be evened out at that point. Okay. Or very convenient, a box of raisins, but always try and make sure you do combine that carbohydrate with the protein. Okay. And Francis, what about if um, they can't carry fresh fruit for whatever reason? What about dehydrated fruit? Are there pros and cons to that? Absolutely. So dehydrated fruit, there is a lot of sugar. And so we know sugar is, um, too much sugar is something of a risk factor. However, again, combine it with a piece of, uh, with some protein. Mm -hmm. um, but there are certain dried fruits that are better than others. Mm -hmm. So apricots have less sugar than, let's say, for example, um, uh, mangoes. Mangoes high in sugar. So just be careful with that. And you don't have to have dried fruit. Maybe there is also uh, some granola, an organic granola that you can easily pick out of a bag as you're driving. Mm -hmm. And so that usually has nuts in there, little pieces of fruit some grain combination. Well, I mean, you mentioned nuts, you know, so nuts and seeds are just fantastic, right? I mean, yeah. you know, if you're sensitive to sugar from the fruits, just go with almonds, walnuts. There are so many varieties of nuts and seeds that you can actually, um, and they're very portable, right. and store sell in them in single serve packs. So um, that's one way that you can actually help yourself. Now, the key, though, is to plan ahead. You know, when I hear about someone saying, oh, my God, my blood sugar dropping and I'm in, a, in the middle of the freeway. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, but you need to do really better planning here because you almost in a way you got to remind yourself if you have hypoglycemia and need to eat six times a day, you got to program it into your uh, watch or your phone, whatever it is, and a reminder comes up and eat your nuts and seeds and drive, you know, in, in case, you know, apple or whatever it is that you bring with you uh, and do it no matter what you're doing. You got to drop whatever you're doing because you don't want to wait until you're famished and your blood sugar is dropping. So it's prevention. It's really not never even getting to that place, right? 
-hmm. So very important. People need to be proactive here and, uh, and not wait until last minute, you know, because, you know, it, for people who have, let's say, for example, um, diabetes and they, they got insulin and they got hypoglycemia attacks that can, they can actually pass out. Right. And so, of course, the fastest way to get them out of that state is orange juice. Uh, but that's not ideal. You don't want to be flooding your body with a huge amount of sugar because, as Francis said earlier, sugar is implicated in cancer metabolism as well. The more sugar you have in your body, in your stream, but it, you know, you're, you're pumping your body with all this sugar, you're actually going to feel cancer growth. That is absolutely, um, you know, studies that have proven that to be true. Diabetics, for example, increase their risk for cancer. Uh, just to interrupt for a second, so our specific person that sent in this question, she also just wanted to point out that she's allergic to all nuts, which is why she doesn't do nuts and seeds. Oh, all right. What about um, ha yeah, hard boiled egg or, or hummus? My favorite, yeah. Hummus, you know, hummus. You can. I mean, hummus is made from cheese and tahini. Take with you. Yeah. There's a lot of nut butters too that actually come prepackaged. Well, she says she's allergic oh, to oh, all right. nuts. Sorry. Yeah. Please. Now, if she's yeah. allergic to all nuts, she might be allergic to tahini as well. But so beans. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they actually have these. <laughs> we were in, we were in Hong Kong just recently, and you know, there. I mean, we saw these packs of fava beans that are just you know they're roasted and they're yeah. delicious. You can't stop eating them. So. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I actually have a question because I know we have our brain mix that we do. I know it doesn't help this particular viewer, but you were talking earlier in the conversation about brain fog. And now when you were bringing up this whole topic of nuts and seeds, is that one of the reasons that you combine those specific ingredients together to make this brain mix? Well, not only that, you know, they're, they're specific like walnuts, right? So right. The, 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 the brain mix, uh, it's a trail mix that has uh, several nuts and dried fruits in there. So the walnuts, for example, uh, has been shown to uh, possess incredible lipids that are good for your brain, brain, brain function. Mm -hmm. So it supports your brain function. And then on top of that, you have like dried blueberries in that mix. Blueberry, the, the uh, actual pigment of the blueberry is a, it's a, one of the most potent antioxidants that have been shown to have neuroprotective properties. What that means is it actually protects your brain cells from oxidative stress, uh, damage, rusting, you know, the, the actual rusting effect on your brain due to aging, due to wear and tear. So the, the combination of all the various nuts and seeds and the dried fruit in that mix is perfect to help support your brain function. But also it's, it's healthy for you. It's tasty and it you know, gets you out of a jam if you're hungry. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, that actually brings me to the next viewer's question. Uh, they wanted to know, because you were talking about diet and nutrition earlier, both of you, um, what does a low inflammation diet look like and also plant-based diet look like? Can you just give us kind of a walkthrough of one day, an example for each? Go ahead. So, yes. Yeah, so one day you could, let's say you start your morning out and you know the French actually for breakfast, because I just went to a French restaurant, they serve salad for breakfast uh -huh. and fluffy eggs. So there you go. You've got a great protein. You have um, some veggies, a nice salad. You uh -huh. could actually saute tomatoes, mushrooms, and onions. Um, also, if you need that protein, and you don't have to have protein right away in the morning either. If you're vegetarian, you can actually add your beans too. So that's one way. Then you can, moving on to the afternoon, something very similar. You know, change it up, but always make sure when you look at your plate, what you're going to eat, half to two-thirds should be vegetables. And don't think you have to leave it to one vegetable. Have variety. You know, in Asian cooking, Chinese cooking, we like to combine our vegetables. So we're going to saute, let's say, for example, cauliflower. We're going to add mushrooms to that, too, and some garlic and some onions. So that in itself is a really great meal. Have a grain, have a light grain, whether it's quinoa or brown rice. Then you can add some tofu with that later in the day and um, get some bok choy, um, shard, saute, um, light steam. And um, yeah, and, and to add to that, uh, things you want to avoid, right? So the inflammatory foods, uh, you know, people may 
may or may not be aware that the solanine uh, family uh, of vegetables are inflammatory. They're, they include tomatoes, potatoes, eggplants, and peppers. Uh, so it's sometimes called nightshades. And uh, so if you, if you want to avoid and lower your inflammation, you should avoid these things. But other things, for example, we talk about alcohol, uh, coffee, uh, of course, sugar. You know, too much sugar is a problem. It's inflammatory. Dairy products. Uh, so we're talking about cow dairy. There are lots of foreign proteins, mainly casein and whey. And people react. The immune system view them as foreign, and it's a, it's a problem. So by cutting that out, some people are allergic and react to gluten, which is a protein found in wheat, barley, and rye. And so that can be inflammatory too if you react to it. So there's a number of things that you really need to pay attention to and, and avoid. Uh, and then, you know, Dr. Francis talked a little bit about uh, anti-inflammatory foods, but they also include some fabulous tropical fruits like papaya, pineapple, with uh, enzymes like papain and bromelain that are definitely anti-inflammatory enzymes. And uh, grapes um, and cherries and a few other things that are, you know, so there are lots of anti-inflammatory foods that you can incorporate on a regular basis. Okay, thank you both. Uh, next question, um, Qigong. You both were talking about Qigong earlier. Uh, one of the questions is, if they don't have access to classes in their local community, what can they do to access this? We provide a lot of really wonderful, I don't know if you can see that, uh, DVDs okay. that are extremely beneficial and easy to watch and very clear and gentle. So that would be probably the best thing to do is to um, go ahead and I don't believe we're streaming this online yet or? Uh, I think we are. Qigong and meditation for cancer support. You know, this is a whole um, home learning module that you can learn from DVD and right. streaming. I, I think uh, maybe Tiffany can provide information later, but this is exactly what Dr. Francis teaches at St. John's Hospital for the cancer patients and uh, so and uh, we also coach uh, we have this you know sort of coaching one-on-one -on -one sessions with our patients too um, and uh, and even for patients who are not currently pa I mean people who are not currently patients of ours at Dow Wellness wherever you live we can always set up a Skype session or a FaceTime session with uh, any of our doctors who are certified in this form and we can coach you okay so really good point um, on for our Facebook uh, viewers and also for our uh, Zoom viewers, I'm coming on to the last question now. So if you have any additional questions, if you could please type those in uh, so that Leah can pass those over to us. Um, my final question that I do have on the list is um, how to source in the community integrative channels, the person would like to know. How do they source? I, and they're, I think they're saying like they're not living here in Los Angeles. So how would they go about finding in their community integrative channels that they could go through? Well, so, I mean, the, it, it may be a challenge, but certainly, you know, if we look at major cancer centers like Sloan Kettering in New York, MD Anderson, uh, Dana Farber, uh, MD Anderson, Texas, Dana Farber in Boston, even the Cleveland Clinic in Ohio. Uh, and the Mayo Clinic, they all now incorporate an inter integrative approach. They offer acupuncturists on staff. They offer uh, nutritional supplementation. Uh, maybe they don't have the Qigong part. Maybe they do. But again, you know, there's, there's a growing trend within the oncology community to begin to offer these and make them available to, to people who need them. There's also the, the, the cancer community right? Cancer support community. It used to be called the Benjamin Cancer Center. And they, I think there's like a hundred, over 150 affiliated centers around the world. And certainly many of them are located in the U.S. And they actually offer so many wonderful resources, um, really at no cost. You know, no, it's, it's a nonprofit organization. So again, these are places where people can start looking. But we are always we always welcome uh, 
if people want to inquire, call us, and we'll see if we can find a referral to someone local to your community uh, that specializes in integrative oncology. Uh, we have a, you know many many oncologists we work with around the country that are very open-minded and are looking to integrate. And we have had a great opportunity and and you know. Uh, having worked with them for all these years. So we're happy to turn you on to people who I think are really interested ultimately in not just, you know, getting rid of your cancer, but to also help you maintain and be the best you can be so that you don't end up, you know, surviving cancer, but then, uh, you know, sort of develop um, sickness or, or other complications afterwards. Right. Okay, marvelous. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, we are now at a quarter after six. I'm so sorry for taking up more time from both of you, but I think everyone really appreciated it, especially when we received all these questions in. So it, it has truly been a beneficial hour for all of us. Um, once again, for everyone, I would like to remind you that this book will be available for pre-sale in the next week. So we will send an update as soon as uh, it is ready for pre-sale on the e-download, and then it will be ready in uh, most likely January for a hard copy. Um, I also wanted to say that uh, next month we will be back with the healing hour. Uh, the topic for November uh, will be taking place on November 28th from 5 to 6 p.m. And the actual topic is metabolic syndrome, what it is and how to treat it. This will be uh, presented by Albert Vodka and Baca, excuse me, and Sally Golubuf. If I'm pronouncing that wrong, please tell Golubuf. me. Golubuf. Golubuf, thank you, because I just always say, Sally, I love you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it's going to be a very good topic. And I think a lot of people don't know what metabolic syndrome, also known as Syndrome X, is. So uh, we will actually be presenting all throughout the month different articles about this and um, educating you on the, uh, the risk factors and um, treatments that are available. And then this will culminate with their final conversation at the end of November. So we hope you'll tune into that. Uh, for you, Dr. Mao and Francis, I just want to thank you both so much. This has been such a wonderful hour to spend with you both and, you know, truly educational for everyone. Again, just to see the feedback that we were receiving tonight, it, uh, it clearly is something that is very relevant to our viewers. And um, I'm just excited to see the, the book and be able to read it, actually. <laughs> Thank you, Stephanie. We are too, and we hope that everybody will spread the, uh, the positive message of living long and living strong. Yes, absolutely. Okay, well, I hope that you both have a beautiful evening. And oh, just for our viewers to know, if you want to be able to pass this along to friends or re-watch it on Facebook, it will be available immediately following the conclusion of this on replay. And then uh, for Saturday, we will be posting this also to our YouTube channel. So you are able to access it. You are able to share this episode with friends too. So we just want to thank everyone for joining in tonight. Thank you again to both of you for joining in. And uh, we will see you next month. All Thank right. You, Tiffany. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.